everybody. Welcome again to this Next Hand Books podcast. We've done a number of these, and we feature different authors of different books who have published through Tan Books. And today, I'm really excited to have with us uh, the great Paul Thigpen, who's done a bunch of books, many of which I've read. I've seen him many times on EWTN, heard him many times on the radio, um, watched him, heard him talk about his different books. And this is actually the first time we've met. I've never actually met before until right now. And we're going to be talking today about his about his book from 2019, Saints Who Saw Hell, which is fascinating. I didn't even know about it until um, very embarrassingly until a few months ago. And I thought, I, I don't I don't know how I missed this, but it is it, it's a it's a wonderful book. So we're going to talk about that and his other works. But but for right now, Paul, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here, Paul. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. So, so tell us a little bit first of, about yourself as an author and what um, the books that you've done in the past. You've done a lot of books, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm working on a couple for Tan right now that will be, will they be 58 and 59? Wow. I've written, I published and, uh, and probably a contract for number 60. So, but I've been doing it a long time. I started, uh, got my, my start in journalism uh, back in the, Gosh, late seventies, published my first piece, and um, though I've done other things, I've been a college professor of theology and worked as a catechist and full time on parish staffs. Was a Protestant pastor before I became Catholic. Um, I've still been writing all along, so um, it's a bunch of books, but I've been writing for a long time. So people think I've done a lot of books. I've done about twenty, folks. All right, great. he's got me, he's got me tripled. All right, <laughs> he's running circles around me here. Now, 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 so hold on a second. Let me back up a couple of these things. So. You, you were a journalist, and um, when did, did you start in journalism, right out of college maybe, or what, when was well, that? I started, yeah, started writing, not as a, like a professional journalist, but as a freelancer, and okay. um, and that kind of led to my first book. I was uh, writing at that time for a magazine with uh, Nav Press, the publisher of The Navigators, an evangelical Protestant publisher, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that led to some good connections, and I wrote, began writing for their publications, and finally some books. Uh, but also, I was. Uh, it started out with kids' books. I actually wrote a few kids' books before I ever wrote books for adults. And um, once I became Catholic, it was kind of an easy transition. I, uh, my my personal testimony of becoming Catholic is the first chapter in the uh, first book by Pat Madrid called "Surprised by Truth." There are several volumes. Those are and wonderful. So, well, he's it's God has used those books for so many things. And so anyway, but my my testimony in that book kind of got the attention of some folks who said, why don't you write for us? So it was a pretty easy transition, which was good because since I couldn't be a pastor anymore and I had to figure out how I was going to make a living. <laughs> well, and, and I think that's that's where I first <laughs> probably came across you. Well, maybe, but uh, but I, I'm a convert as well. And th- those books, Surprised by Truth, which are, which are taken from the C.S. Lewis phrase, right? Surprised by Joy. Right. Mm-hmm. And they they are, you know, I, th- th- those are, I think, the single best volumes of apologetics that have been done. I, I mean, there are individual memoirs that are very influential. I mean, we think of Kimberly and Scott Hahn, Rome Sweet Home. But but the Surprise by Truth series is just fantastic. And and I, I, yeah, you're the very you're the very first entry in the first volume. In the right? first volume. Right. Yeah. Wow. His wow. open arms welcomed me. That's the title of it. About how the crucifix attracted me before, even from the time I was a kid. And you yeah. and you had been so you were Protestant. What which denomination? <laughs> well, I like to say I, I was a walking ec- ecumenical movement, or I still am. Sure. Uh, so I was. Uh, let's see, born into a family that was practicing Lutheran. Uh, eventually baptized in the Presbyterian Church as a kid. Um, became an atheist at the age of twelve and. Was that for six years through junior and senior high school? Um, traumatic conversion experience at the end of my senior year. Uh, then after that, yeah, I was really looking for a home. I ended up being part of Assemblies of God and two non-denominational churches, and uh, youth minister for a Baptist church and Sunday school teacher for an Episcopal church, and um, so almost every major de- denomination I was involved in. And, and, and then finally, and the, well, and, and then. And, 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 yeah. This is a typical. This is a typical story, right? And mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I'm a convert as well. Although actually, 
I'm technically a revert because I, I was brought up in the church in the mm-hmm. in the 70s, uh, the dark mm-hmm. ages, as Robbie George and I come <laughs> right? The dark ages. <laughs> yes. So so I I became an atheist like like most people probably do when they went off to college, right? Um yours became an atheist at the age of 12. Hold on a, I want to revisit that in a second. And and then after that, so I became a Christian through evangelicals and you just sort of church hop, right? You you go to the yep. church with the the best best sermons, the best music, contemporary or um, or traditional, right? The best youth groups, and yep. you, you're you're often really not very creedal or, or connected to a particular denomination, and and for for many of us, it's that lack of authority and that sort of religious relativism mm-hmm. that that eventually kind of beckons you home to Rome, and maybe that's what what happened with you. That was part of it. Uh, part of it was that I started a well, first of all, my, my undergrad degree at Yale was in, in religious studies, but I, I really made it kind of a focus on church history. And that began to plant the seeds. And as, you know, Don Garland Newman, the saint, uh, once said, to be deep in history, it ceased to be Protestant. That's and right. then my master and PhD program at Emory were, were in church history. And the more right. I read, especially the early church fathers, the more I was convicted. St. Augustine yeah. especially, yeah. Yeah, the Newman quote, right? The the more you read the Church Fathers, the, the more you cease to be Protestant, right? Yes, yes. And did you say did you say you went to Yale uh, undergrad? Undergrad, mm-hmm. undergrad. Okay, and then Emory for um, the master's, master's in PhD, PhD, right? And and in, in, in church in church history. Now, so um, it's interesting you started Lutheran, which a lot of us call sort of Catholic light, right? I mean, the Lutherans. Uh, this is the irony of Martin Luther being the cause of. The separation and the Reformation is that the Lutherans, they are probably closer to us than anybody else, right? Consubstantiation, more sacraments than any of the other denominations, or at least closer to our seven sacraments. Uh, but but you but you became an atheist at age 12. That's that's pretty young. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it's the stuff I was reading. I had a, a seventh grade science teacher, I mean, sorry, not science, um, history teacher who at the beginning of the, my seventh grade experience uh, put some Voltaire into my hands and said, you oh. read this. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I was young and foolish. And, uh, and I suspect part of it at a level I didn't realize was kind of my rebellion against, you know, adolescent rebellion. Uh, of course, this is back in, it have been 69, um, drugs and alcohol everywhere, other stuff, but I wasn't willing to turn my mind over to any of that stuff. So I think what happened is that that's kind of what, how my rebellion took its, its you know, version what what, uh, what it did. But yeah, after reading, especially Voltaire and some others, I just said, oh my gosh, it's not real. I was, I was genuinely convinced. That's one of the thir- first worst things you could do is turn to Voltaire. You would have been better off turning on, uh, <laughs> turning on uh, in, in Legata de Vida or uh, Led Zeppelin or, <laughs> yeah. or, 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 or something like that. Aaron Burr, after he shot Thomas <laughs> Jefferson, right. said, uh, said, said, I should have read less Voltaire. <laughs> Marx's father, Mark Karl Marx's father, read Voltaire to him when he was a young man, right? It's it's just one of the worst things. Voltaire, Voltaire is so destructive. So so that so interesting that that was your form of rebellion then in your teen years. And and I so I have to ask if you don't mind. You said you had a, a dramatic conversion in around the age of eighteen. Yes, uh, several things happened. I don't want to go take too too much time with it, but I had after Voltaire become like a perfect little enlightenment kid. You know, I was convinced that um, that we were, not only that Christianity wasn't true, but that uh, if we could just form ourselves properly in education, that we could perfect ourselves. So I believed in the perfectibility of humankind and uh, went through a, a period then, uh, I'm in the deep South, I'm still in Georgia, in Georgia, I've lived in other places, but I was born and raised in Savannah, Georgia, where um, school uh, desegregation came about and even though it had gone well for a couple of years, and I was a, uh, I went to a high school that was all black until I and my friends went there and had this wow. great experience of community building. Um, I got involved in student government. By my senior year, I was convinced we were going to, you know, all this all this other stuff. I've been thinking about sin. It was stuff that could be overcome by our efforts. And so we were building a, a, a biracial, harmonious biracial community. And then my senior year student body got swapped around. Short story is we had writing, um, terrible writing. Uh, Friends of mine, both black and white, out to kill each other right in front of my eyes. And um, it's just, I remember coming home that day, it just shattered 
everything. This idol of humanity that I put up on a, on a, a pedestal was just smashed. And I thought, yeah, none of that's true either. But then I had, so you know, you became a Calvinist. <laughs> well, no, no. <laughs> I should have. The Maybe total depravity of man right before yeah. you there. Right, right, right. But what, you know, what happened was I, um, I had friends who, you know, began to come alongside me, pray, pray for me and with me. Um, I had uh, several adults that I really respected who were just very vibrant Christians. Um, I had an, uh, some ex- what I call experiments in prayer. Uh, connected to the first first thing we just talked about, the um, few weeks later, I'm out on campus walking with a Christian friend. We come around the corner and we see a mob of big group of whites on one side, blacks on the other. They've got this is the day before schools had, you know, metal detectors. They have chains and tire tools and knives and stuff, screaming, cursing at each other across a you know, strip of grass. Wow. Really, it, it was about to happen again. I just said, oh, wow. I can't take this. My friend next to me said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to pray. And she dropped her knees. And we were at least 100 feet from them. They weren't even looking at us. So our behavior wasn't influencing them. And she dropped her knees and began to pray. And, Paul, I had a dilemma. You know, I I didn't believe in God, but I I didn't want to see my friends suffer. I just loved them so much. And 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 you didn't want to to call on Voltaire either at that moment. (laughs) (laughs) So I finally just said was, you know, Okay, I'm gonna just gonna humble myself and pray. It wow. maybe it'll do something. And I, I, I knelt too, and I said, God, if there is a God, this can't be Your will. Do something. And Paul, the most amazing thing happened. If I'd written it in, you know, a novel later, nobody would have believed it. But the editor would have said, take it out because it's not believable. So get up from praying, and all of a sudden, somebody on one side of the mob begins to laugh. And it becomes a belly laugh. And it's this contagious laugh where all of a sudden everybody around him is belly laughing. And then it jumps across the strip of grass to the other side. And they start belly laughing. And as they're belly laughing, all the anger trains out. You can see them just kind of go limp. And they finally shrug their shoulders and turn around and walk out. Wow. Now, if I, you know, if all of a sudden a SWAT team had descended between them (laughs) and stopped them, later on I could have said, well, that's just a coincidence. Somebody had already notified the police. It just happened to be right after I prayed, right? Wow. Well, what, what do you do with that, you know? Oh, wow. wow. It's just, it was so obvious. And I could tell you know, other stories. But and, so, between, and, so, and so what did you do with that? At that moment, you realized it, right? I mean. Well, you, I said, okay, this is, I'm going to take this seriously. And I started going back to the Gospels to read. But but it was only one of, you know, several things. The other, I'll just say briefly, and, and that's one reason why I've written about spiritual warfare so much, is that uh, I had gotten involved in the occult during those six years. And one night in my senior year, not you know, not long after this, I had a, I won't go into detail, but a terrible, terrible encounter where all of a sudden I realized that up until that time, I didn't think there was a spiritual world. I didn't think there was a life after death, a human spirit, everything. I was materialist, philosophically. But I thought maybe we could learn more about this from a scientific viewpoint and maybe there's something going on that's an actual, a, a normal capacity of human beings that hadn't been discovered yet. And I actually, for my seventh grade science project, going back to when I was 12, um, wrote off to Duke University. They used to have a, an institute for parapsychology and asked for testing oh. materials through that. Wow. Got a blue ribbon on the project, but it was a short step from that kind of thing into seances and Ouija boards and stuff. Wow. But anyway, one night, one night then during my senior year, they nearly killed me. And it, um, I escaped. That's a very dramatic story. I won't take up time with it, but Basically, by the Lord speaking to me, focus on the cross and like seeing a cross and focus on it. it like, oh. um, but after have that, you, I had you, to go back. Have you written about that? I, I referred to it briefly in the Surprise by Truth story, but not, not the details. Um, but anyway, it's uh, and that's that's the thing that motivated more than any. You know, I'm thinking, OK, it's there is something else out there that my tidy little enlightenment worldview does not you know account for. I better find out what's what's going on. And if if there is a devil and there's no God, I'm really in trouble. Um, well, I, and so I, I went, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, and so um one thing in particular that the the thing that came after me that night had said to me, and I was near water, near our home, we lived on the water, like uh I'm gonna throw you into the water. That's so clear. And I knew what that meant because I couldn't swim, even though we lived on the water. And then the thing took over me. It took two guys to hold me down. It's just a very dramatic thing. Wow. Um, so at that night, after I'm thinking about all this, uh, 
I just said, oh my gosh, I remember a story from the gospel when I was a kid where the a demon possessed boy's father said it throws him into the water and the fire and then into the fire trying to kill him. And I said, what if it's the same thing? Wow. And other, other things happened. A guy who had been with me that night uh, told me, one of the guys who was with me said, oh, I've, my, my, this happened to my girlfriend once. And I, so I asked him, you know, is your girlfriend religious? You go to church. He said, oh, yeah, she goes to the church. She goes to the church of Satan. She's a witch. <laughs> and I thought, wow. Wow. What century am I living in? Oh, no. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, I'm probably telling too much. But no, no, all that, that, no, that's just so that's, much. That's, it's riveting. I, I just reached over into my bookshelf and grabbed your book of spiritual warfare. And, um, you know, I th this is published by Tan. And I go to this all the time. In fact, I, I keep it on this page. Mm -hmm. Prayers, um, prayers for the home and the family. Yeah. And anytime yeah. I just kind of feel anything, uh, any sort of dark darkness or whatever or unease, I go to that, and I walk around the house and I, I I I pray I pray those prayers. But that you need to write about that. And 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 also have have you have you written about the 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 moment with the with the belly laugh and. And the and and segregation of the two sides pitted against one another. Again, I did that? refer to it in, in "Surprised by Truth." I don't remember how many details I wrote. Uh, Tans talked to me about doing a spiritual memoir, which I'd like to do, just you including do. all those kinds of stories. You should, do. but I got a, these a few others. I got to get done first. But, right, right, yeah. And and I'll, and I'll revisit those toward toward the end of the talk. By the way, now I'm going to read the "Surprised by Truth" thing tonight. I'm going to go grab that from the <laughs> okay. shelf after we're we're done talking. I'm, I'm going to read that. So, um, all right, just 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 fascinating. So you've done you've done all these all these different books. Um, by the way, do you do you have a favorite among them? People ask me the same thing. I'm like, eh, not really. I, know. I don't know. For just for the subject matter, the one called the biblical names of Jesus, beautiful, powerful portraits of Christ. I enjoyed write, writing that so much, and I was so nourished spiritually by going deep into a number of names from Scripture about who Jesus is. And just rediscovering stuff and and learning new things that help me to see them in a whole new way. That's Probably that's that actually, that's yeah. very that, that's very innovative. That's yeah, that's very interesting. And and how how many of these have been done through Tan through Tan Books? Oh golly, a lot, six or eight maybe something like that. I'm thinking okay, yeah. and you, and you were and you were editor at Tan Books mm -hmm. for a while at one point. Now which which years were those roughly? Mm, oh gosh, and you're going to ask that. Uh, I think it was like 2013 through 2016, maybe something like that. I have to look. Yeah. Okay. And, and part of it, I, I love the folks there and, and I'm still publishing with them. I you know, love to see them and love being with them. It was just that I, I felt this pull back toward parish ministry, uh, which I had been doing until actually until the end of May when I retired, but um, just to be one on one with folks. And uh, sure. I still I will always love to write and want to write and believe I have a mission too, but. But uh, being in the trenches, you know, with folks. Yeah, and and it's it's hard. I mean, I'm doing this right now with uh, Patrick O'Hearn, the new editor, and I'm editing some books while I'm also under contract for a couple others. And as you know, it's hard to write books while you're editing books. It's yeah. it's it, it really really is. It's, it's hard to separate the two, especially if um, if your natural inclination is a writer. And um, and for me, I'm always writing articles and you know, that too. So it's it's really it's really hard to do both. And and I've found that um, it's kind of weird, right? But the but the very best editors don't publish books usually. For, for <laughs> They're whatever. too busy editing. Yes. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. right. It, it's kind of like it's kind of like um, yeah. My dad <laughs> used to talk about guys uh, guys who are golfers. You know, why, why are the why are, why aren't the best golfers? Why are they the teachers? Right? The teachers. <laughs> they, they, you know, they, 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 yeah, it's kind of, or or hitting coaches in baseball, right? You know, uh, who's the hitting coach? I never heard of him before. You think the guy would hit 400 <laughs> a couple times, right? If he's yeah. hitting, right. But um, so, all right. Now, now, th so this book, Saints Who Saw Hell, this came out in 2019. And it says, Saints Who Saw Hell and Other Cat uh, Catholic Witnesses to the Fate of the Damned. And this this is a book that, um, you know, it's, it's uh, to, you know, to borrow a phrase, right? scary as hell i mean it, you you read about this and anybody who 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 doesn't think about this stuff or or who or who doesn't fear death and and you know what could what could happen read this book i i, I mean it it is really frightening stuff this is this is visions of actual saints 
So you start with an introduction, Hell Matters, and then two chapters after that. Then part one is Visions of the Saints, which goes from chapter three through 14. It's really the heart of the book from St. John Bosco, St. Teresa of Avila, down to you know, Pope St. Gregory, Alphonsus Liguori, in between, St. Hildegard of Bingham, Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, um, St. Faustina, we're actually recording this today on the feast day of, of St. Faustina. In the middle, bl uh, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. By the way, I don't, I'm looking for a book right now. I've got volume one, volume one, volume two. Do you have any, any idea why she's not a saint? I, I do not understand uh, the, the visions that she had, the stigmata that she had, the crowns of thorns and everything else. Um, it's just, just un unbelievable. The life that the life that she had, she died 200 years ago at, at this yeah. point. You know, you know, canonizations can often have all kinds of political <laughs> things. Um, you know, the fact that she was German could have, there could have been a while where that got delayed because of the world wars or something. I'm just speculating. Right. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, some of the controversy over some of her works and, um, that some people will take it as gospel truth, and um, and there are things in there that seem to be historical anomalies and things. So that um, there had to be a clarification on the part of the Vatican that her cause for canonization is not a, an imprimatur for her works, especially since there's some uh, suggestion that her spiritual director, who was also recording these things, that he he changed something. So that's not to take away from it, but just to say it's the kind of thing that could slow down. Uh, canonization process, I guess. Well, and and with her, the three days of darkness, perhaps, <coughs> right? That yeah, that 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 could be it. And okay, so I was not sure who to start with first, but let, let's take a look at her. So she was okay. 1774 to 1824, a German Augustinian nun, and she was she she had the stigmata on her body. Also, not just on her hands, but 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 also on her chest of, of, of all things, and and also the crown of thorns as well, which she said was so bad she couldn't she couldn't even rest her head in her pillow. That's how bad it was. And at first, these were invisible, like like Catherine of Siena, and I guess like Faustina as well. But they later became visible, and this was extremely well documented. I mean, there's just there's no question. The German scientists and and doctors who were who were in her room all the time and the visitors. And it just, I mean, that probably tormented the poor woman more than anything else, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, like Padre Pio, yeah. the just constant, right? Here's a book on Padre Pio under investigation, the constant, 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 mm -hmm. constant affirming of this. But among the things that, that she said here, so she talks about Jesus entering hell, the city of hell and I'll skip to kind of the end of it. She talks about seeing hell. Many were chained down in a circle that was placed around other circles. In the center of hell, I saw a dark and horrible looking abyss. Into this, Lucifer was cast after being first strongly secured with chains. This is on page 49. Thick clouds of sulfurous black smoke rose from its fearful depths and enveloped his frightening form in its dismal folds. God himself had decreed this arrangement. I was likewise told, and this Paul fascinated me, and I wrote a piece on this for um, Tan Book's new blog, which is being run by J.P. Uh, Sonin. Called, I wrote a piece called Unchained. And she writes, I was likewise told, if I remember correctly, that the devil will be unchained for a time 50 or 60 years before the year of Christ 2000. Now, she's writing this 200 years ago. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, maybe this might be one of the reasons that her cause for canonization hasn't been approved. But you know, that would be the devil being unchained around 1940, 1950. Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, my gosh. I mean, just, yeah, think about what happened during those years. For starters, the Second World War and the Holocaust and right. all those other things. But then, you know, the, the advance of Marxism, what happened? Yeah. Russia and China after that. Uh, oh, my goodness. Oh, on and on. It's, uh, yeah. And, and she says here, the dates of many other events were pointed out to me that I do not now remember. <clears throat> but a certain number of demons are to be let loose much earlier than Lucifer in order to tempt men and to serve as instruments of the, of the divine vengeance. I should think that some must be loosened even in the present day. 
and others will be set free in a short time. By the way, since you mentioned Marxism, she died. Um, she died. Marx was born in 1818, and this she was alive at that time, right? So I mean, I don't know. I can't confirm that. I wrote a book called The Devil and Karl Marx, but I am terrible about what I can say and what I can't say, right? I can't. I can't. I can't. I'm sure they were contemporaries. That. Yeah. Anyway, they were right, contemporaries. Right. Yeah. And she said it would be utterly impossible for me to describe all the things that were shown to me. Their number was so great that I could not organize them sufficiently and define them and make them intelligible. But but th what's really interesting about this, Paul, too, is that it, this idea of, of the devil being chained for this period, I mean, th this is consistent with the book of Revelation. Right? Exactly. Yeah. The language is the same there. He's chained for a thousand years, and then shortly before the end, he's released again. Yeah. So, yeah, for our Protestant friends, which you and I were, right, the Revelation section 20, <laughs> verses 1 through 7, talks about the devil being unchained for a period for a period of 1,000 years. And so if I could bounce back here, and this relates to the piece that I wrote on your book for, for, the, for, the, for the TAN website, St. Hildegard of Bingen, who was just a just a brilliant woman, a, a doctor of the church. I mean, every feminist in the world ought to know who Hildegard of Bingen is, yes, yes. right? And, yep. and yeah, she she lived German as well, Benedictine, uh, born in the year 1098, died in 1179. So this is on page um, 39. She had a vision of hell. And going through this, Some Souls in Purgatory, page 41, all right, here we go. Page 42. Think about how this might connect to the book of Revelation, the devil being chained, and Anne Catherine Emmerich saying the devil would be unchained for a period of 50 years prior to the year 2000. So Hildegard of Bingen, writing in the 1100s, said this, a chain was riveted around the neck of the worm. She, de she describes the devil as this big, ugly, monstrous-looking worm binding its hands and feet as well and secured and securely fastened to a rock in the abyss. In this way, the monster was restrained so that it could not move around as its wicked will wished. Tongues of fire issued from its mouth, dividing four ways. One part ascended to the clouds, another breathed forth among the people of the world, another among spiritual people, and the last descended into the abyss. So following this timeline here in the 1100s, the devil is still is still chained, right? But according to Anne Catherine Emmerich's chronology, 1940 to 1950, the devil is unchained. So if all of this adds up and there's a thousand year period, and these two saints are right with their visions, we're in this period right now. If they're so, if they're correct. Yeah. And if it's a you know literal thousand years, that's always the right. question in Revelation. Uh, Saint Augustine. Uh, taught that, like so many numbers there, that this rounded number of a thousand meant a really long time. And he thought the thousand years referred to the age of the church, that at the time of the crucifixion and resurrection, the devil was bound. And uh, through the age of the church, he remains bound. He can't do everything he'd like to do. There are all kinds of things he was up to in BC days, especially among the pagans, that now he can't do but that when it comes close to the time of the end, at least St. Augustine interpreted that passage was that God will release him again for a short mm -hmm. time. And uh, so the thousand isn't exact, it's just the age of the church. But, you know, it was, that was kind of his, his interpretation. It's, uh, it's been interpreted other ways too. Hmm. And the, so of, of all of these, do you, do you have, I was going to say, Say, so do you have a particular favorite? <laughs> you can't have a favorite vision of hell, right? I mean, it's just, you know, that's kind of a silly way to explain this, but. Well, I the, could say I have a favorite visionary of these, okay. of these. Not so much, excuse me, the vision, but itself. But um, Jacinta, the, at St. Jacinta at Fatima, because uh, such a, you know, sweet, innocent girl, she's just a child. And she's allowed, you know, they're allowed to see this horrible vision of hell when they, which they talk about, you know, damn souls like snowflakes descending into the fire. Mm. Um, but the amazing thing is, and she's such a good example for us, is that after she had that vision, then she, her, her life changed in such a way that she was continually praying and making sacrifices for the, the souls who could be, who were in danger of damnation. And she would, even little sacrifices like a child would do, she would 
she she go out to the, you know they were shepherds and she go out in the middle of the day and in the heat of the day rather than drinking the water to make a sacrifice for the souls in danger wow. she would give her water or her even her lunch to the sheep <laughs> and things like that's that that's a just child a little doing child that. it's a child doing that and it was always uh, uh, sister Lucia you know says later just she was always saying to us pray for pray for the people in danger of hell pray for them you remember what we saw and uh, and so I do have a favorite visionary among all these. That's what a oh my goodness, which a what a powerful thing. So it was that indelibly marked in their mind, in their soul, mm-hmm. and and they saw this um, that summer of 1917, right? So uh, the Blessed Mother first appeared at Fatima May 13th, 1917, and then you have the several months in between, and then the miracle of the Sun October 13th, 1917. And yes, yeah, so this, so Jacinta Lucia Francisco, and this is on page 61. She, Our Lady, continued, she said to us, sacrifice yourselves for sinners and say many times, especially whenever you make some sacrifice. Oh, Jesus, it is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners and a reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And, you know, for non Catholics listening or familiar with the Rosary, Every time you do a decade of the rosary, you end with a Fatima prayer, right? Yes. Oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Yeah, and so that is, that that comes from this. That's that's how profound this was. And, and, and as they said, and this was a question that I wanted to ask you, they said there are so many people going to, into hell, like you said, almost like mm-hmm. snowflakes mm-hmm. falling into hell. One thing I tried to discern from this book or take away from it. I didn't get a clear answer and it's okay. You weren't aiming for this, but is hell hard to get into or easy to get into? Right? Well, the scripture says that the way, you know, way of damnation is wide and many there are that go and the way to salvation is narrow. I I don't know how else to interpret that at the very least, but even if you're not going to say that says something definite about the actual numbers who end up in both places, it sure sounds like that it's a broad way means an easy way where a lot of people can go narrow way means it's it's harder to get to. And, and I it, think that's the case in our lives, isn't it? I mean, we're always having to fight against sin. We're always having to make a choice day after day for God. And it seems like, it, it, at least according to some of these visionaries, some of these mystics, that that you're, you're given a final chance until the very end, right? Um, and in some cases, some of them have said, might be Faustina, I'm not sure, that um, you know, there are some people until the last moment can ask for forgiveness, but some are so obstinate, so hard-hearted, right, that they that they refuse, right? They refuse to believe, and those are the ones that are really doomed. And of course, as Catholics, we believe a lot of those in between, I guess, so to speak, there's a purgatory, right, for 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 some of these people. It almost seems I remember when I wasn't Catholic, and I and I thought, Paul, there has to be a purgatory because there's got to be mm-hmm. some some sort of middle option at the very least. Um, well, yeah, and for me, it's just, okay, when we die, you know, how many people you know, even if they're good people, they're not perfect. But the scripture makes it really clear. You got to be perfect to see them face to face. So does God wave a magic wand? Right. That, that's not how he does it in this life. And so no, the, you know, but by, by in his mercy, I, I was talking to someone in RCA um, who was from a, a tradition that taught that, um, that yes, you do have to be perfect, uh, you know, to be in heaven. But that if you're not perfect when you die, too bad. <laughs> and she was just so ecstatic when she heard about the doctrine of purgatory. She says, it's wonderful. It's God's mercy because I, I was afraid that if I wasn't perfect when I died, I, you know, all was lost. But then, no, God keeps working on you. If you made that choice to, to die in friendship with him, he keeps working on you. So that's well, why. yeah. And yeah, so there needs to be a, there needs to be a period of purgation in a sense for, for, for everyone. I mean, I, I can't imagine that I'm worthy of, of of heaven, of just walking right in. I mean, you know, I, I've certainly well, earned my time in purgatory. You know, we're not fit, and we're not fit for heaven yet. That's that's the thing. To be in right. heaven, when you're perfected, you won't, even though your will will be more free than it's ever been, it will be perfected in such a way that you would never choose to disobey God's will. We're not we're not there yet. We're, um, if C.S. Lewis, you know, a wonderful writer, and, and his the great divorce. Basically, that's about the purgatorial process. It's a fiction, right. fiction. But in that, he makes it clear that those who have not been through the process yet are so uncomfortable <laughs> trying to get to heaven because it demands change. And so only the ones who are willing, it's kind of, you know, 
allegory of what goes on now as well as there. Only those who are willing to go through the painful changes possible are ever going to even be fit to be there. And, right. Yeah. And so it's uh, it makes sense. It's, it's, again, we're not earning it, but we're we're becoming fit for it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. In a way, you can't earn it. Right. I, I exactly. Mean, yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You, you need to be fixed. You need to be purged. Right. You have to go yeah. to a place where it's kind of beyond your ability. Right. Yeah. To be cleansed and made yes. worthy. Right. And, you know, and, and when we get there, too, we don't have our won't have our bodies for a while while we're there you know, until the resurrection. And I've often thought about this. So many of the weaknesses in the human in human life sometimes have genetic and physical components that make it even harder, whether it's addictions, for instance, would be one example, the predisposition, that kind of thing, that when we're when we finally make it or will to you know to the purgatorial process, those things will be be those chains will be off of us. And we can finally get all that worked out by God's grace, cooperating with him without the body doing that. And then at the end with our resurrected body, never again a problem. So right. it is, right. it's God's mercy. Yeah. <laughs> but I well, actually, I wrote, wrote another book. I'll just mention real quickly. Yeah. Uh, one's, one's called um, Last Last Words, um, Final Thoughts of Catholic Saints and Sinners. And it was a, just a collection of, with commentary of last words from mostly right. well-known yeah. Catholics, but some others. And, um, same kind of thing you were talking about. It's, you know, I have a whole chapter there of people who in the end said no to God. And it's terrifying. It's uh, it's just terrifying. Wow. One Catholic prelate who, while he's in his room dying, he has a vision of these horrible monkeys climbing all over the walls and coming for him that he knows are demons. And um, and he's asked to repent. He says, no, I can't. And that's it. <laughs> you know, it's just, or I won't or whatever. But Wow. Well, so we mentioned Faustina and related to this, yeah. this exact point. So this is on page 64 of the book. And so Faustina born in 1905, died in 1938. She was she was 33 years old, this Polish nun, the, um, the apostle of mercy, right? Jesus told her, you will be my secretary of mercy to preach, uh, you know, to, to, to bring to bring mercy to the coming generation. Mm -hmm. And, and so she dies in 1938, speaking of World War II, one year before the Nazis invaded Poland. Um, in fact, one year almost to the month that, that the Nazis invaded September 1st, 1939, the Soviets invaded September 1739. Uh, Poland gets it from both sides, Hitler, Stalin back, World War II started. So you talk about a world that will need a notion of mercy, right? So, so she was given that vision and she died in 1938, but but she's not canonized until the first Polish pope, as some 62, well, decades later. She becomes in 2000 the first saint of the new millennium. So if you think about that, how how profound that is, right? But this, the, mm -hmm. if anything, we need a notion of mercy today. Yes. The new millennium yes. is really, really going to need it. But yes. she talks here, and, and you have on page 64, Today, she said, I was led by an angel to the chasms of hell. It is a place of great torture. How awesomely large and extensive it is. They all say that, Paul, don't they? They all mm -hmm. say it's mm -hmm. a massive place, right? This ma By the way, so how many of them, too, talk about circles of hell? You see that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and and even a lot of, I don't know how Dante figured this out, right? But But some of them even talk about, what Dante would later call contrapasso, where where you're where you're punished, uh, kind of in direct relation to the type of of vice that you or sin that you were responsible for in, in life. And, and that actually that goes back to the the ancient ancient times, the, the apocalypse of Peter and Paul. Those, and it's very clear that you know in all those, the punishment fits the crime. It's a poetic justice of the crime. Yeah, so it, Dante was Dante was actually drawing on a whole genre that we call. Um, Tours of hell have been called tours of hell. Say more actually, about that if you could. But, right, yeah. yeah, I actually I learned this when uh, some years ago. The only the only novel, the only fiction I've written as you know, book book length, uh, was called Gehenna. Then it, second edition was given the name I really didn't like that my visit to hell, but um, I took the basic storyline and characters of Dante's Inferno, but then set it in 20th and then updated it to 21st century Atlanta. <laughs> it starts, you know, because some people say Atlanta's, you know, right next door to hell, but <laughs> parts of it anyway. And then, um, and then the character was in certain ways like me, but others, and same kind of thing. I, I did some inversions uh, 
So I realized when Dante wrote about hell, he made it this great dark, you know, wilderness. Um, but I realized that in, in our day, the wilderness, the, everything's changed. The wilderness is no longer seen as the kind of scary place where the witches and the demons and the, you know, terrible critters are. It's seen as the place of refuge and recreation. And the city is the place that's seen as the great, the place of crime and, and um, noise and, and evil of all sorts. And so I may turned it into where the, it was a great city that was decaying with rings going down, circles going down, rather than the, the forest. Anyway, and, and that book, uh, one of the things I learned is that um, Dante was drawing on a number of, I mean, of course, he did remarkably original things too, but was drawing on a number of earlier texts in the Christian tradition that have been dubbed tours of hell as a genre. Wow. Um, in, in which somebody on earth goes to hell and then comes back to talk about it. And that's why uh, some of uh, the present book we're talking about, Saints Who Saw Hell, and I, I have that that second line, you know, that uh, subtitle, and other Catholic witnesses, because not everybody in here, majority of them are canonized saints or in the process. But I added a few at the end, including Dante, who were just other Catholic witnesses to the damned. And it includes several of those figures then from earlier times, who, whose names we don't even know. But, but there were, I mean, we talked today about um, after-death experiences, right? And people... Mm -hmm in modern times who saw heaven or who saw hell. So, mm -hmm. I mean, even, even way back when, I mean, th those people were around. There were people then who had those experiences too and talked about them. What's really different about the saints is they, they don't actually die and then go see hell and come back. They're, they're, right. they're visionaries. They, they have visions, right? They see these things. But in those days, there were people, right, who had that experience mm -hmm. and talked about it. And so these experiences were known about. This isn't just a 20th or 21st century thing. No, not by any means. And and you also have, you know, cases of that where they come back, they're reporting to everyone. So they've been in an equivalent of a coma or something, anyway, near-death experience. Come back, and then they'll say something like, and while I was there, I saw that such and such at the next village, um, right. as, as he, he went to hell, you know. He, and, and that's so they Dante, would, right? And then that's they would say, uh, well, he does, yeah, same thing. But I mean, this is way back when, and, and the earlier ones, and then uh, like in the medieval ones. And then they send a messenger to the next town and say, what about so-and-so? He said, oh, yeah, he died, you know, right at the time while the guy was having the, the vision. And it, it's like a objective proof that the guy was really seeing something real. It wasn't right. just a dream. Right. Yeah. Yep. And the so I'll get back to Faustina in a minute, but since we're on this point. So you have two chapters on the Apocalypse of Peter mm -hmm. and the Apocalypse of Paul, right? And you write here, this is on page 109 of the Apocalypse of Peter. The Apocalypse of Peter, or also known as the Revelation of Peter, contains the earliest known Christian description of hell outside of the New Testament. So people yep. think about that, right? Think about that statement. Dating from the middle of the second century, it claims to be an account of a vision that Christ granted to St. Peter of both heaven and hell. Now, you know, a lot of our Protestant friends will say, okay, but you're talking about something that's not legitimately recommended as part of the canon of the New Testament. Okay, all right, but just hold on. Uh, St. Clement of Alexandria, who lived roughly 150 to 215, considered the book to be inspired scripture. The anonymous author of um, the famous uh, Muratorian fragment, right, did as well, including it in what is now the oldest surviving list of New Testament books. However, the same author notes that not all the local churches of the day allowed it to be read in the public liturgy. A fifth century historian reports that in his day, it was read in the churches of Palestine each year on Good Friday. Now, the church, you know, still, um, the church decides the canon of Scripture, right? And these are knockdown, down drag-outs of church councils. In the end, though the Apocalypse of Peter was popular among many early Christians, it was not included in the biblical canon of the universal church. At least two fragmented versions of the book have survived, one in Greek and a longer one in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, right? And here, if you go through and you read this, this is another one that is just frightening. It's, real, it's, really, it's really frightening. And so is the one that follows with the Apocalypse of, of Paul. And I'm looking through my notes in here. I have, like Virgil to Dante, sounds like Dante, ditto, inferno, right? And, yeah. and, and worms and blood. And, and also, too, there, there, are some, there are some punishments in these two books for abortion, which really stood out at me. And, and, and also, I'm not going to be politically incorrect, um, uh, politically incorrect and leave this out. 
homosexuality as well. You know, that's that's, the that's mm -hmm. yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's in here as well. And again, this this didn't this didn't make the canon of the of the final books of the New Testament, but it's 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 striking. Even Clement of Alexandria thought the thought the thought the Peter book should have been in. Yeah, and, and the reason I included that is, you know, I want to make it really clear, just you know, with none of these, are, except I guess I do have a section on biblical references to hell, but and in none of these are we saying that they're on the same level of scripture, but they still have things to teach us. And like you said, to, to realize, just like the Didache, which is written actually before, apparently before some of the New Testament books were completed, does refer specifically to abortion, you know, as, as a heinous crime. Um, right. That to see it in these early things is, is a testimony to the continuity of the church's teaching on some really important issues. And, you know, some people will say, well, why didn't Dante you know, have a section on abortion? And um, that's a good question. But what you have to realize is that when they were writing, what was included were kind of the, the most common, obvious, public, publicly known and, and uh, widespread sins of their day. Right. And in the in, in the time of Dante, because of the Christian church's teaching, the Catholic church's teaching, abortion surely would have happened, but it would, you know, it was not like it is today out in, out in the open and public. Um, and so he didn't he didn't write about it. Uh, but these earlier folks, you know, written, written when the uh, Roman Empire was still, you know, the pagan empire was still in place, um, abortion was a very common thing. And, and so you see it showing up in there where there's, you know, there's a reference to it. Uh, uh, by this, I was going to say, by the same token, Dante includes stuff like uh you know with the the greedy folks um that he has the folks who in, in his day there were people if they were really wealthy like in the italian city states um they would have parties in which to in a vain way to show their wealth to everybody they would make big bonfires of money and furs and other kind of stuff just to show that they were so wealthy they could burn it wow um so those come up you should you see those in dante's inferno but you don't see it now you know we, we do things we waste our money in other ways but so all this to say, um, these are also good indicators of what were the burning issues at the time, and that just because Dante didn't include something doesn't mean that from the beginning of the church it hasn't been a, a serious grave matter in the eyes of the church. But it, yeah, but it was not a time where abortion was commonplace, mm -hmm. especially in Italy. I, I mean, Catherine of Siena, who's in this book, was I think the 24th or 25th. Uh, child in her family, <laughs> right? Her mother, her mother Lapa had had like 24, 25 children, right? So, so you know, she she wasn't they 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 weren't having abortions. Uh, and, and since I mentioned homosexuality, uh, Dante has that in in the Inferno, and I think it's um, an area of hell uh, that's that's um, that's arid, right? It, I think it's to represent like um, infertility in the sense of um, not being um, uh, uh, productive, right? Not being able to reproduce. Uh, Roger and, and, talks about this in his book. On yeah, Dante. and also, un, you know, unnatural. Um, interesting, and Dante, that that occurs, or what happens in the same circle of kind of with those who are in unnatural practices, um, includes usury, you know, uh, interest, because, it, you know, their point of view was the, the interest is this way of trying to put too many, Two pieces of money together and, and force it to produce more money when that's unnatural it's, it's not you know money doesn't multiply itself and so they saw usury um you know ex excessive interest or for some folks any interest at all is sure. that kind of thing so that was one of the heart was at the heart of there that um that that it's a natural thing and that it's um that it's kind of an insult to god whose whose image the human person is when we reject the way he's done it we reject his artwork and say no we can make it better i mean that's that's part of what's going on there in dante and in, you know that book. I, i'm watching the clock i can't believe how fast the time is flying um but, but let, let me return to faustina and so she says on page is on pages 64 to 65 of your book saints who saw hell saint faustina the kinds of tortures that i saw the first torture that constitutes hell is the loss of god the second is perpetual remorse of conscience. The third is that one's condition will never change. I mean, right then and there, just try to think about that, right? This Despair. horrific condition that you are in um, at that moment in hell of all places will, will, will never change. The fourth is the fire that will penetrate the soul without destroying it. 
a terrible suffering since it is purely spiritual fire lit by God's anger. The fifth torture is continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devils and the sounds of the damned see each other and all the evil, both of others and their own. The sixth torture is the constant company of Satan. The seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses, and blasphemies. These are the tortures suffered by all the damned together, but that is not the end of the sufferings. uh, There are special tortures designed for particular souls, and this is like Dante Contrapasso, right? Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable suffering related to the manner in which it is sinned. And uh, then she writes, let the sinner know that he will not be tortured. Uh, th- let the sinner know that he will be tortured throughout all eternity. And those sense and in those senses in which he made use, use of to sin. And she says that uh, as the Fatima children did, when I came to after this vision, I could hardly recover from the fright, right? Their, their, their hearts, their minds had to be steeled. By, by whoever ever took them there, or else they would have died of, of fright at the very sight of, of seeing the indescribable horrors that they saw. And it's, you know, I've, I've written before about the fear of God, and that is understood so many times, misunderstood so many times. But so we have this kind of fear, and a lot of people, even with my novel, you know, set in hell, I had a, a pastor tell me one time, well, I would never let any of my people read that because it would just send them into despair. And um, but even in that novel, the, the really the theme is grace, and with these, there's a reason why these people are allowed to see these things to warn us, yes. so that we won't end up there. That's the point, not to just keep us terrified all the time. It's it's to give us hope in God's mercy and to say, "I repent now. I don't want that. I want you, Lord, to turn to Him." And so, it, nothing gives me more delight than when someone reads either my novel. Uh, set in hell or this book and says, Paul, after I read it, the first thing I did was run to the confessional. And I said, praise God, that's the point. <laughs> right, right, right. That's the point. Yeah. Well, and maybe this statement would do it from <laughs> from Catherine of Siena. Um, this is on page 55. And do you know why, uh, do you know why they cannot desire good? Because their life has ended and their free will is now bound. For this reason, they cannot attain merit. It's over, folks. It's it's over. You've had your chances. It's it's over, because the season for doing so has passed. If they finish their life by dying in hatred with the guilt of mortal sin, their souls, by divine justice, remain forever bound with the bounds of hatred and forever obstinate in that evil. In this state, being gnawed by themselves, their pains always increase especially those the pains of those who have been the cause of damnation to others. So, you know, if if that doesn't uh, <laughs> that doesn't get you there, I don't know what does. Yeah. And the the fear of God is it's a good thing. You know, the, the Old Testament says it's a, it's a clean thing, it's a purifying thing. And, and 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 Jesus some people say well that's all the Old Testament, but Jesus said don't fear men, fear the one who can cast you into hell. So the fear of God is a good thing and but it's uh, it's a healthy fear because it's you're basically saying, you are God, you're holy. Now, there are only two options, to live with you forever or live apart from you forever. And mm-hmm. if I want to live with you forever, this is the way I've got to live and to grow in your grace. And and so to fear, you know, I, that's part of what happened with me in my conversion experience. I, I had an encounter really with the devil and with demons. And that sent me running the other direction right into the arms of God. But I didn't know it at the time. That's what would happen. And that's what can happen this way with us, too. So Catherine of Siena alludes to that. Um, This is on page 57. See, folks, this is why you got to buy this book, all right? Um, The devil, dearest daughter, this is God speaking to Catherine, is the instrument of my justice to torment the souls who have miserably offended me. Think about that. And I have appointed him in this life to tempt and harass my creatures not so that my creatures will be conquered, but so that they may conquer, proving their virtue, and receive from me the glory of victory. No one should fear any battle or temptation of the devil that may come to him, because I have made my creatures strong and have given them strength of will fortified in the blood of my son. 
neither devil nor any other creature can move that free will because it is yours given by me. You can freely choose then to hold it or leave it as you please. It is an instrument and you place it in the hands of the devil. Right away it becomes a knife with which he strikes you and slays you. But if you do not give this knife of your will into the hands of devil, of the devil, you will never be injured by the guilt of sin and any temptation. Um, and then he said to her, God did, you see then the devil is my minister to torture the damned in hell and to exercise and prove virtue in the soul in this life. And, and so, you know, that's the point you need to, you need to straighten up now, straighten out now. Yeah. And he'll give us the grace. He, he gives us the grace. And, 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 and the scripture says, no temptation has overcome us except what is common to man with the temptation. He'll give us the grace to overcome it, to stand strong. Uh, if I, I guess uh, if I make this political point, I wrote a piece for National Catholic Register last week about um, Nancy Pelosi saying, um, uh, explaining to Eric Rosales of EWTN News Nightly uh, why she favored this abortion bill. And she said, well, God has given us a free will. And th this is not how you're supposed to use your free will. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what you're supposed to do with it. You're given the freedom to choose, but you're supposed to use it the right way. Right, that's not the way that you're yeah. supposed to use it. In my mind, that's a kind of blasphemy to to call, use God's name to justify yeah. that kind of behavior. That's it, it so really is. Yeah, they'll have to answer. There'll be an answer. They'll have to answer for that. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, the Catechism, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Right. Deuteronomy thirty nineteen. I lay before you a choice between good between um, um, life and death. Choose life. Right. Choose life. Thou shalt not kill. You're not to use your free will and, and improperly. Well, that our time is flying. Let me uh, <laughs> let me let me wrap up by by asking. So, so so what what's next? What what are you working on next? And and this was 2019. Was did you have a book last year that I that I missed or anything that came out since? Oh, let then? me see what's come out since then. Uh, children's books, some children's books, and uh, their picture books. John Foley, who's uh, a wonderful illustrator, their tan books has cooperated with me on those. And there's another one of those coming out. I have one last year called um, uh, Angels in the Era Raid, a, a Christmas ABC for kids. And he did beautiful illustrations. This year it's a Christmas counting book. And then uh, he also- What's that one called? Christmas what during the air raid or what? No. <laughs> what was that? Angels, Angels in the Air a raid. So that's- Oh, a raid. A, a, a raid. Uh -huh. All right. So okay. it's a Christmas, it's a Christmas um, ABC. So it starts out with, it takes every letter of the alphabet and then um, in rhyme and and uh, with alliteration, it talks about some figure or part of the Christmas story to tell the Christmas story. But it starts with A and goes through Z. And then the second one does the same thing, but it's a, a counting book. So it starts out with one little boy and then two, you know, Mary and Joseph and then on like that. So that's kind of fun. And there's some others that I've done with them. But um I don't know if I should talk about the next one yet because it's the kind of thing that it'll, it'll uh, there'll be some people who want to say, you're writing about that, uh, depending how old they are. But um, I'll, I'll wait on that one. Okay. But the one I'm really excited, another mm -hmm. one I'm really excited about is that uh, Tan in the Past has published a book um, called The Life of Mary is Seen by the Mystics. And again, it's it's private revelations. And, wow. and the book started with a big thing, say, you know, big essay saying, this is not gospel. They don't even agree among themselves and all that. But what we've done is just woven a narrative of her life with scenes from the mystics as they saw her. They've asked me to do the same thing for St. Joseph. So wow. I'll be, be finishing that up, I hope, by the end of December. And then I uh, should come out next year. And that would probably have some, uh, and uh, Catherine Emmerich as well. Exactly, yeah. I mean, Maria de Agreda probably, and some others, yeah. Mm -hmm. she, probably had, she probably had more visions than anybody, right? I mean, in, yeah, in especially of, surrounding the, you know, the life of Christ and, and Our Lady. So uh, there'll be plenty in there about St. Joseph too. Very good, very good. And listen, you, you've got to write those memoirs or at least write somewhere or maybe in the preface of one of your books. Tell that story that about the, the civil rights groups that you know, pitted against one another, the two sides, and and um, and the chilling story too, maybe about you know what you went through during that time with the occult, because it's I I think that's what really moves people, right? For people mm -hmm. to hear true stories, it's hard for them to relate to Hildegard of Bingen right? <coughs> in the 1100s, 
or, or to even somebody who's, you know, a, a canonized saint, uh, a Faustina, the children of Fatima, two or three children of Fatima. But for um, Paul Thigpen, a guy who's alive and, you know, right now, it's a regular old guy yeah, and Emery. I mean, they yeah. can came out of the 60s. A lot of people can relate to exactly what you're talking about, especially in yeah. this modern age where young people are just fleeing religion terribly. Well, my wife told me she doesn't think anybody would read it. <laughs> maybe no, she's wrong. She's wrong. Our wives that, always tell us that. They humble us. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, that's, the, that's no, their no, job. I'm that's their you, job. But, it. you know, but, but I would just say it wouldn't really be like a spiritual autobiography. That's why I call it memoirs. Right. Mostly, I just have a bunch of true stories, personal stories, some of the things I could tell you that just I still can't hardly believe they happened, um, that God has done for me. And and I would I think it would encourage people to, to hear those stories and say that could happen to me, too. Sure. You know, Scott Hahn is really good at writing a book on, like, say, Hail Holy Queen, about the rosary, about Mary, <clears throat> but starting it off by talking about uh, a terrible moment when his grandmother died and he went in and found her rosary and started ripping it all apart, right? And you read that and you're shocked. And But that, you know, that, that gets your attention. He's very good, I think, at bringing in those kind of personal moments, insights, and then connecting it to the larger point in his book. And and uh, I, I think you do that as well, or you know, or or we'll continue to do more of it. I hope. Well, thank you. God, God grant me the time on this earth and, and the energy to do it in the you know, sound mind. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Well, thank you very much. So, all right, folks. Uh, Paul Thigpen, Saints Who Saw Hell. You got to get this book. And uh, Steve Cunningham, our fabulous producer, will post something up there on the screen right now. If he hasn't already, I'm sure he has. And you, you got to check this out. It's really good. And for anybody that's living their lives sort of casually as if um, as if there's no hell, <laughs> get them get them this book. This 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 is this is a wake up call. So, uh, Paul Thigpen, thank you very much. Oh, what a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. God bless you and all your viewers. Thank you very much. And uh, and everybody at Tan Books or join us. Uh, join us. Check out our website. And join us again for another edition of these, these discussions. We'll see you again soon. Take care. God bless.